All right, Matthew chapter 13. Because I started this Bible study after some of our college students had gone off to school, I want to do a little bit of a review and then we'll get into some new material. If you look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse 1, the Bible says the same day, so you see that there's a continuing action from chapter 12. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And I want you to notice immediately right here that you see a separation between Jesus and the people. He's not among them. He's separated from them. And verse 3 is such an important thing. And he spake many things unto them in parables. And then he goes on to talk about the parable of the sower. And... Um, just by way of review, if you have heard anything taught on the parables, it's probably wrong. What is the common definition of a parable? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? That's the, how many of you ever heard that definition for a parable? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Um, so the question is, is that what a parable really is? And just like we saw with, how many of you were interested that the biblical definition of charity is the opposite of what the common understanding of charity is? That's, that's, that's an amazing concept. It's the same thing with parables. So if you don't have this cross-reference written down right here, you need to. Look at Psalm 78 too. Let's get a biblical definition of a parable. Psalm 78, 2, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. So a parable is a dark saying. All right, a dark saying. So an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, that's a positive connotation, right? Isn't that nice? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's like Aesop's fables for Christians. It's, it's cool. It's nice. It, it, that's different than a dark saying. A dark saying is not good. Parables aren't good. Parables are a very sad thing. So go back to Matthew chapter 13. So look at verse 3 again. And he spake many things unto them. You see that those next two words in parables, in parables. Look at verse 10. So verse 9, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, What are you doing? That's, why speakest thou in parables? Because all of his teaching before that has been very detailed. It's been very clear. But now he starts speaking this, this parable that has no... There's no power or understanding or anything. Let's look at the, that first parable. Let's just read it so you can see what, what they're questioning. So in verse 3, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. What an amazing message. Do you see why the disciples went, huh? He got done. That's his message. Now, see, we infuse it with all kinds of Christian meaning now. But when those people heard it, they're thinking, OK, what does that mean? So now the disciples ask him in verse 10, and his disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto what, what's that next word? Them. You might want to mark that. It's really important in parables. He answered and said unto who? Right. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto who? What's it say? 
you to know the what? Of what? The kingdom of heaven. But to them, it's not given. So I'm going to teach you the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. I'm not going to teach them the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Remember what John the Baptist's message was, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They didn't repent. So if you look at Matthew chapter 12, this is, in Matthew chapter 12, this is what is called the unpardonable sin. And the, verse 24, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself cannot stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Now notice it says the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is an earthly, physical kingdom. All right. Then verse 12, Or how else can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me. Now, when George Bush said that after 9-11, that doesn't have the same power as when Jesus Christ says it, right? He's not with me. And what does he say? And he gathereth not with me as scattered abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So what's happening here is this, look at verse 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So what's happened here is they've committed the unpardonable sin. They, they have accused Jesus Christ of being Satan. Jesus Christ said that everything he did was through the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Spirit at his baptism descended on him like a dove, and the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. From that moment on, everything he did was through the power of the Holy Spirit. They are rejecting the Holy Spirit. That's the unpardonable sin. From that point on, Jesus never speaks clearly to the Jews again. The Jews were not cut off at the cross. They were cut off at the end of Matthew chapter 12. And Jesus begins speaking to them in parables. So the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are the mysteries about the, the kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to come and establish on the earth. That's what these parables are about. These parables don't have anything to do with the church. So that's why I say most of the, if you've heard a sermon preached on the parables, it's probably wrong. These parables are specifically kingdom parables. Um, so when you look at verse 10 again of Matthew chapter 13, and the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So he goes on to show that what he's doing, these, this next passage, he quotes this passage um, several times in the scriptures, but they never, they never believe him. They never believe him. And this is that Isaiah passage that I don't have time to go into. Look at verse 16. So what he says is that they... No, look at verse 15. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest uh, at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But now, So that's Israel. But look at what he says to these disciples. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these, those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. And then he goes on and explains the parable, and I'm not going to do that tonight because we've done that. If you're interested in that material, it's available on uh, CDs from Pastor Nathan. Um, 
But what he does in this in this parable, the parable of the sower, is he establishes what these images are. So the field is the world, the sower is Jesus Christ, the um, the birds are Satan, and so he establishes some things that will always be. I will say this: um, the fire is always fire. So the judgment that he pronounces, it's not a symbolic judgment. The fire is always just fire, and hell has fire. And we'll see that again in a minute. Um, I think that's enough. I do want to make sure that you understand there's a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, look at Romans, keep your place in Matthew 13, Romans 14. Verse 17. This is the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So it's not a physical thing. It's not you can't get it through communion. It is something that comes as a gift from the Holy Ghost. Look at Luke chapter 17. Look at verse 20. Luke 17, 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. All right, You can't see the kingdom of God. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. So you enter into the kingdom of heaven. You can walk into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is in you. And the, the best way to remember it is that God's a spirit, and so the kingdom of God is spiritual. Heaven is real. It's physical. It's not a spiritual thing. It's a real physical, tangible thing. And so that is the physical, tangible kingdom that Jesus Christ will establish on this earth. All right. So when Jesus says, go back to Matthew chapter 13. And look at verse 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So he wasn't going to give them any, the Jews, Israel, any more information about the kingdom of heaven, but he was going to teach the disciples. So now look at um, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them. So you see that another is just continuing the thought. Another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened. Do you see that? The kingdom of heaven is likened. Look at verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. Verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is is like. Um, So, look at verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. Why? That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret, from the foundation of the world. And so what Jesus is doing is he is keeping it secret from the Jews, but he's revealing it to his disciples. That's what's happening in this text, okay? So that's the background of what the parables are and how they work. Um, So why is it that people mess up their teaching on the parables? All right, see if any of us know this verse. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So you don't want to be ashamed. You want to study, and you want to rightly divide the word of truth. When you don't rightly divide it, you wrongly divide it. And wrongly dividing the truth leads you into all kinds of trouble. Look at Proverbs chapter 20. It's either 26 or 27. Let me get there, and I'll tell you. It's 26. Proverbs chapter 26 Here's what these people are doing. This is pretty hard language, but it's just the Bible. The legs of the lame are not equal. The legs of the lame are not equal. 
All right, so I messed up my knee skiing just shortly before I moved here. So I had a complete reconstruction, ACL, MCL, meniscus. I damaged my sciatic nerve. And so what's happened is my right leg has shrunk up. And I got to tell you, any of you who have a curved spine or a leg that's longer than the other, any of those things, it's not good. It messes up your whole body. It's terrible. You know, it's like the girl Eileen. She had one leg longer than the other. <laughs> that is one of my favorite jokes. Um, but look what the Bible says about that. The legs of the lame are not equal. So is a parable in the mouth of fools. So a person that doesn't rightly divide the word of truth, a person that doesn't understand the Bible, they make fools out of themselves when they teach a parable. It never works. How many of you have ever read the parables and you hear some of the symbolism and you try and apply it to now and it just doesn't make sense? They don't work. That's because they're not for us. They don't have anything to do with the church. Let's go on see if the Bible says anything else about it. As he that bindeth a stone in a sling, so is he that give honor, giveth honor to a fool. So you got your sling, and you're going to throw your stone, but you tie the stone to the sling. That's not smart. <laughs> right? That's, that's, that's a very foolish thing to do. So don't give honor to a fool. As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. So it's painful. It hurts. It messes stuff up when a fool utters a parable. And a fool utters a parable when he gets it out of its context, when he doesn't balance the Bible by the Bible, when you don't understand the context of the passage. It's interesting. Go back to Matthew chapter 13 with me. Just take a guess, based on Bible numbers, how many parables of the kingdom there are. Without even counting them, just take a guess. Seven. There are seven kingdom parables. So God is giving us a complete understanding of this mystery of the kingdom. Now, there's much more information, but we have what God wants, the primary information God wanted those disciples to know about the kingdom through these seven parables. So let me give you an overview of the kingdom parables. So the sower, the parable of the sower, Remember, that gives four eras of time when God is coming and trying to give the information to Israel. Remember that the parables aren't for us, they're for Israel. Can I show you something really cool? Some of you remember this. This will be new for some of you about this. Look at um, so Matthew chapter 13 and look at the end of verse 43. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Do you see that? Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, if you look at verse 9, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Do you see that? Now go, keep your place in Matthew. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Look at verse 7. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto who? The churches. The churches. He says that at the end of every one of these uh, seven churches. He hath ear to hear, ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Go back to Matthew chapter 13. So let's just look at verse 9. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. What's missing? Yeah, what the Spirit saith to the churches. The Spirit didn't start talking to the churches yet. That doesn't happen until, look at John chapter 16. Look at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. 
but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And then drop down to verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So what's going to happen when the Holy Spirit comes? Jesus leaves, the Holy Spirit comes, and then he gives them the Bible. That's what's happening. They remember. How in the world could the disciples remember? I was reading Acts chapter 2 this morning. I'm reading a chapter in Acts every day, just reminding myself of the, that book. Started that yesterday. And it's interesting when you look at it, that the, the Holy Spirit comes and he starts teaching. And um, what I was thinking about was Peter's sermon there. We have exactly what Peter said in that sermon. Because the Holy Spirit brought those things to, to Luke's remembrance when he wrote that down. That's what the Holy Spirit did. So, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's what's happening in our time. Jesus Christ himself was speaking. But it was through the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the disciples were able to write down what Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 13. That's how we have that. It's because the Holy Spirit gave them perfect, absolute recollection of what he wanted them to write down. That's what's going on in that text. But one of the things that you can see, those kingdom parables are for the Jews. The, the churches, those messages to the churches in Revelation are for the churches. Because he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Then in Revelation, what the Spirit saith to the churches. That's left out, okay, from Matthew chapter 13. Okay, back to Matthew 13. I'm not going to take time to go through those four eras that... Uh, are identified in the parable of the sower. If you're interested in that, you can get that uh, CD. Um, then the second parable, if you look at uh, verse 24 of chapter 13, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. So this is the. If you look at verse um, thirty-six, then Jesus sent the multitude away, and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, "Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field." What was that? What, what were you talking about? And so he gives them a, a detailed explanation of that parable to these disciples. Of course, the rest of the group is gone. They can't hear it because he's hidden the truth from them. And he explains that to them. But what this is, is this parable is the parable saying that there are two types of seeds. Those seeds identify um, the inhabitants of the kingdom. So in the kingdom, you're going to have believers. Those are the good seed. And you, that, that's the, the wheat. And then you're going to have unbelievers and they're the tares. And I can't... <laughs> I want to reteach the whole thing. We'd never get out of here tonight. I can't do it. So, but remember, this is not talking about saved and unsaved people in the church. The only way you have to worry about that is if you go to a church that admits unsaved people into membership. All right. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. And if you are in Christ, you can't get out of Christ. No one is going to take you out of Christ, no matter what you do, what you say, how faithful or unfaithful you are. Your salvation is not kept by you. Your salvation is kept by Jesus Christ. The wheat and the tares have nothing to do. The wheat and the tares has nothing to do with the church. It's Israel. So remember Matthew chapter 25. Verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So when Jesus Christ comes in his glory, now the rapture is not him coming in his glory. Nobody sees him. We, we just disappear and we go up into the clouds and meet him. It's for seven years we're in heaven with him. Then we return to the earth in glory with him, with his angels. And there's some other stuff that happens that's identified at the end of Matthew chapter 13 that we'll look at in a minute. 
But so when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to judge the nations, verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. All right, the sheep are going to go into the kingdom. Look at what it says in verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit is it salvation? Is it eternal life? What's it say? The kingdom. the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. All right. Look at um, verse 20, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay. And so what's going on is the righteous, these that are declared righteous in this, in this judgment, go into the kingdom. Those who are the goats go to hell. That's what's going on. And then in Revelation chapter 20, we're not going to take the time to turn there, but remember what happens, that death and hell stand before the great white throne judgment and then they're cast into the lake of fire, right? And it's always that same fire. You'll see it all the way through Matthew, and it's obviously the same fire that's addressed in Matthew chapter 25, Revelation chapter 20, Luke chapter 16, hell has fire, Mark chapter 9, it's all through it. So when you see the, the, the sheep and the goats, that's the same thing as the wheat and the tares. It's the same thing. So the parable of the sower is dealing with four periods of time or four different offers to Israel. The seeds or the, the wheat and the tares, that's the inhabitants of the kingdom. Those that go in, and oh, I didn't, let me just make it real clear. The basis for whether or not these people get to go in the kingdom is how they treat Israel during the tribulation period. That's the basis for it. And that's, in as much as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. That's Israel. That's how they're treated in Israel. You can read that in Zechariah chapter 14. It makes it very clear that's exactly what's going on. Zechariah chapters 12 through 14 would give you all that understanding. Okay. Then the, the next is when you look at um, verse 31, another parable put he forth unto them saying the kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed. So here what you have is you have the growth. You have growth in the kingdom. And the Bible says that the children of Israel are going to be like the sands of the sea. Well, if you have a thousand years of reproduction with almost no death, that's going to be a lot of people. And you'll have to check out some of the passages in the book of Psalms. We might populate the planets. All of those things, the Bible talks about that. Just really interesting stuff that takes place in the kingdom. All right. So there's growth. It's going to grow like crazy. Look at verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and become a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So the birds, that's Satan. That's, that's wickedness. That's the wicked ones. That's the tares. They're going to be in the kingdom. And so as the kingdom grows, remember those people, those nations who come into the kingdom because they were kind to Israel, some of those people follow Christ, some of them don't. Remember at the end of the tribute or at the end of the millennium, Satan's loosed. And these people who are the tares follow Satan and then they're wiped out. They're taken away. Um, I'll show you. Well, I'll just show you right now. Look at uh, verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. All right. So the, what you see in the parable of the mustard seed is growth in the kingdom, good and evil. There's going to be good and evil growing in the kingdom, but Jesus Christ rules and reigns with a rod of iron. Now, let me just ask you this. Why would it need to rule and reign with a rod of iron if everybody was sinless? There'd be no need for that. 
right? They need to do it because these nations have come in. Look at verse um, 33. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. The meal's fine. The leaven is bad. So you have good meal and bad leaven. And what happens when you put leaven in your meal? It grows. It grows. And so you have growth in the kingdom, good and evil. Now, so now I want to get into some new teaching tonight, now just for the next few minutes. Look at what it says in verse... Um, let me show you something pretty interesting. Verse 42, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And uh, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So look at verse 16. I want you to see something interesting. Jesus said, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Well, then why is he saying at this spot, remember here in this particular passage, Jesus Christ is teaching the truth of the parable to the disciples, not the others, not those that he's not the Jews that he's hiding the truth from. Why does he say that here? Because Judas is there. All, th all the way up until Judas does his deed, Jesus gives him opportunity to repent and to hear. But he didn't have ears to hear. Now, there are reasons for that. Maybe we'll go through that sometime and I'll show you. Now, look at verse 44. What's that first word? Again, so he's continuing. Remember, the images are the same. The explanation of those images will be the same. And he gives no explanation for the rest of these parables. He just gives the information. Uh, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So these two parables, it's interesting. I mean, people, they talk about this being the gospel and that the gospel is hidden and it's worth everything, sell everything you have to get the gospel, or that the pearl of great price is the church and Jesus Christ gave everything he had for the church. These are kingdom parables. These don't have anything to do with the church. So the treasure in the field. Let's, figure, let's see if we can figure out what this treasure is. Keep your place here. Go to Exodus chapter 19. What's the best commentary on Scripture? Scripture. scripture. All right. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Now therefore, what's that next word? If, so what is this? This is a conditional covenant. This is a conditional situation. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar, what's that word? Treasure, Treasure unto me above all people for all the what? The earth is mine. So this is a peculiar treasure hidden in a field. The, the field is the world, the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 13. Now go to Psalm 135. Mouth of two or three witnesses, let the thing be established. Psalm 135, verse 4. Let's, let's read verse 1. So Psalm 135. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the name of the Lord, praise Him, O ye servants of the Lord, ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto His name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto Himself, and Israel for His what? How about that? So who's the treasure? It's Israel. So go back to Matthew chapter 13. So when we're doing this overview of the kingdom parables, the sower, that's, that's the four periods of time that 
God offers uh, his kingdom to those people. And then the, the seeds or the wheat and the tares, that's the people that are in it, the good and the bad. Then the, the parable of the uh, mustard seed and the parable of the leaven, that's good and evil growing in the kingdom. But here what we start to see are the requirements of the kingdom. The requirements of the kingdom. So go back to verse 44 of Matthew 13. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. It's interesting, in order to be a part of spiritual Israel, all right, the, remember what the Bible says in the New Testament, all that's Israel is not spiritual Israel. Just because you're born a Jew doesn't mean you're part of Israel. What do you have to, what does it cost for these Jews, listen, in the tribulation, we're gone. The preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're gone, right? What does it cost one of these people to get into the kingdom? Everything. Everything. Look at what it says. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Remember what it's... Here, let's just look at it. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So, it's such an interesting thing. Um, so, this is when Antichrist sets up an image of himself and defiles the Holy of Holies, what's called the Holy of Holies or the holiest of all, in the new temple. So, Jesus is saying, when you see that happen, this takes place three and a half years into the tribulation period. He's telling the Jews, he's telling, look, remember, Matthew is God's book presenting to the Jews that Jesus is king of the Jews. That's who this is written for, right? This is the book that tells them about the kingdom of heaven. The phrase, the kingdom of heaven, is only found in Matthew. So he's explaining what's going to happen in the kingdom of heaven in Matthew. So here's what he says to it. Let whoso readeth, let me, look, when you're in this, when you read this, Understand, when you see this happen, look at the next verse. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. It, what is it? What's it costing? Everything. Leave everything. That's what he's saying. Why? Because you're going to have to bow and take the mark of the beast. If you don't, you're going to be killed. If you take the mark, you can't go into the kingdom. You're going to hell. That's what's happening. Um, look at Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What are those next three words? Thy will be done where? In earth. in earth. Give us this day our daily bread. Do you have to pray for your daily bread? No. No. This ties back to Israel. They had to get it in the manna in the wilderness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Look at verse 21. For where your... There will your heart be also. It's Israel. What do you treasure? What do you value? For them in the kingdom or in the, in the tribulation, they're going to have to value this kingdom more than anything else in the world or they're not going to get into it. Because most of the nations are going to be against Israel. Um... Look at uh, chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12. Remember, we were looking at this. They've just committed the unpardonable sin. Look at verse 35. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. 
and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he goes on and he talks about how the, the, the Gentiles believed, but you guys won't believe. He moves straight away from Israel to the Gentiles. And from that point on, he's only speaking in parables. But what you see here is that what you treasure, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What do you value? And aren't you glad that every idle word of yours isn't going to be judged at the judgment seat? Anybody here saved? There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Isn't that good? This is for the people who reject Jesus, that rejection, that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, they're going to be judged by that. Jesus said, I'm not going to judge you at the last day. The words that I speak unto you, that's what's going to judge you in the last day. You're judged by your words or believing his words. Praise God. Isn't that good? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Ready for this? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's the only thing you're going to be judged at as a believer. Did you confess him with your mouth? Yes. And then your work will be judged of what sort it is, and you'll receive rewards or you'll, you'll lose rewards. But, man... Man, I'm so glad. I've said so many foolish things. I'm glad I don't have to pay for that. <laughs> Jesus Christ paid for it. Amen? That doesn't mean to go ahead and start talking foolishly. Right? We're still supposed to, you know, a fit word rightly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Let no communication proceed out of your mouth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. So, that treasure, it is, it costs everything. Then look at uh, verse... 45, again, and are we still talking about the kingdom of heaven? Yeah. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold what? All that he had, All that he had and bought it. So what's it cost? Everything. Everything. You know what's interesting about a pearl? It's not like a diamond. It's not like a ruby. A pearl's an organism, not a rock. The other thing is you can divide a diamond and have another diamond. You divide a pearl, you have garbage. You can't do it. So this, this organism of Israel and the kingdom, that's what needs to be bought, this pearl of great price. Um, here's how we know it's not salvation. You know, people talk about this pearl of great price being salvation. Those are the people that are lame, that, that you know, can't speak a parable, teach it. Look at Acts chapter 8. Can you buy salvation? Acts chapter 8. Look at verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Now this was the, the power to give someone the Holy Ghost by laying out of hands that the apostles had. But that was a gift that they would give through God. You, you can, this, this gift can't be purchased with money. And of course, we know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, right? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the what? The gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then... So that's the idea of buying salvation. But if it's the pearl of great price that Jesus came and purchased with money, that, do, that doesn't work either. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. 
The church wasn't bought with money. The church was bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. This pearl is not um, the church. This pearl is the kingdom and Israel in the kingdom. Okay, so go back to Matthew chapter 13. Look at verse 47. So again, ver- the, that sixth parable, um, that what are the requirements to buy that pearl? Everything. Everything. That's what it costs. Aren't you glad you don't have to give everything to Jesus in order to be saved? You have to place your faith and trust in Him. Are you glad you didn't have to pay anything to get saved? You didn't have to give anything up to get saved. You had to believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, does He want you to give some things up as a believer? Yeah. Yeah, put off the old man, put on the new man. You don't do that to get saved, though. You do that because you are saved. All right, then. um, Oh, this is such an important thing, and I don't want to miss it. So in both of these parables, the parable of the treasure hidden in the field and the parable of the pearl of great price, in both parables, men exchange one group of earthly possessions for another treasure located on earth. That's pretty cool. That's an interesting thing. The kingdom promised to Israel is always located on earth in its final consummation. So let's make sure we understand that. Go to Psalm 37. All right, start reading in verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. If if you would just connect the words of the Bible, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That mystery of iniquity is that wicked one is going to be revealed. For the fault... For uh, he won't be revealed until there there come first a falling away and all of that, okay? So, um, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. If you'll do what I say, then you'll be my peculiar, peculiar treasure. Isn't that interesting? Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. What did we read in Matthew chapter 12? Out of the treasure of your heart you speak. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit what? The earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. You see that? Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. Uh, just let's let's compare this. Look at Second Thessalonians chapter two. What do the meek inherit? The earth. Second Thessalonians. Chapter two. 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our, ga- our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man be- deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Look at so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's that abomination of desolation from Matthew chapter 24. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not. Look at this. What does it say? The love of the truth that they might be saved. Um, so, out of the abundance of your heart. All right, so go back with me to... Um, I'm not going to take the time, but Matthew 5, 5, you know, that's where Jesus Christ tells them, the meek shall inherit the earth. All right, so the kingdom is promised to, it's promised to Israel is always on the earth. And so what's going to happen is they're going to have that new earth that happens after the tribulation where Jesus Christ restores the earth. Then the earth is destroyed and they get a new earth and that's what Israel gets and we get heaven. It's an amazing thing. Look at, we'll finish up with this. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Have we seen that anywhere tonight? So what, what's happening? Look at Second Thessalonians chapter 1. I could take you to a bunch of passages, but let's just look at this one. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the, you know, well, you know, I'll keep going. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be, what's that word? Revealed. Revealed. Remember, the rapture, you don't see him. All right, so the revelation, the appearing, when he's revealed, that's the second coming. Shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction for the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When is this going to happen? When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, that's New Testament and Old Testament, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Then look at what it says in that day. In that day, okay? So the, that's the judgment of fire. It is genuine fire. And then one last thing I want you to see and we'll be done. Um, look at verse 51. Jesus saith unto them, Have you understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. They got it. They got it. Uh, let me just read this to you. There's no reason to discredit these men. They understand the kingdom of, of heaven in these things the Lord has revealed unto them. It is now clear to them that the kingdom will be mixed with good and evil until the day the Lord takes the kingdom and removes all that offend. But it's really important to understand, they still don't know anything about His death, burial, and resurrection. They don't understand that yet. They don't know anything about the church because none of that was revealed until the Apostle Paul came. They didn't understand it. So let's look at those passages to make sure that we get it. Look at Luke chapter 18. So they understood those things about the kingdom of heaven, but they didn't understand about the church. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem... And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. 
and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. So that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, right? And they agreed with all of these things and said, we've been preaching this for three years. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. All right, so they didn't understand the death, burial, and resurrection. And then let me show you that they didn't understand the church. So look at Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for who? For you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given who? Me to you, word. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Remember, mystery is something that is true, but it won't, can't be known until God reveals it. Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So, what's going on here is until it was revealed to, the, to Paul and the apostles, the church wasn't known. So none of that was revealed until the time of Paul, which was well after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they simply didn't know those things. It wasn't revealed to them. So that's what's going on. They understood some things. They didn't understand all of them. But what they understood was this information about the kingdom of God. or the, I'm sorry, the kingdom of heaven. And again, here's how we know that they didn't understand the church yet. All right, go to Acts chapter 1. I didn't have this in my notes. I'm so glad I remembered it. Verse 6. So this is, remember, after the resurrection of Christ, right before His ascension. He's been with them 40 days. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Okay, you died, you rose again. All that's good. We didn't understand it. We didn't know it until it happened. But are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They understood the kingdom. They didn't understand the church. All that information had to come. It's interesting, isn't it? All right, there you go. That's it. Thank you, folks.